What's up YouTube? Daryl here from Zephyr Wargames and today I am bringing you my anti-meta Dark World deck. Now this deck has started to pick up a bit more steam as a lot of decks have started to top certain events because it has the capability of going first with a hand loop but also going second with pure all-out aggression. So with all of that out of the way, please smash that like button, hit that notification bell and subscribe. Getting this video above 50 likes in the first 24 hours will unlock more Dark World content whether that be test hands or updates to other variants. With all of that out of the way, diving head first into the profile, we start off with Triple Genta alongside Triple Snow and Triple Rainbow. Now, these are, as I've said in all of my Dark World profiles, the cogs that keep the game or the deck turning. So Snow searches out any Dark World card, um, Rainbow lets you search out any level 5 to or higher monster, so obviously you're going to be going for your Grethers, your Silvers and your Golds. And then Genta is discard as a cost to the graveyard, has to go to the graveyard, so it cannot be activated under uh, Rise Heart, and that will allow you to search out Gate of the Dark World. So Genta plus any other Dark World gives you a draw plus ultimately the second Dark World effect. So that's how you can get Rainbow, which will give you your resource loot because Rainbow has the additional effect, quite like Greffa, to um, return a Dark World from the board to the hand and then summon itself back from the graveyard. Except, um, so the Greffa needs to be a um, can be anyone, whereas this one needs to be a level 7 or lower. So Rainbow can't bounce back Greffa, but Greffa can bounce back Rainbow. I've, I've stuck with two Greffa. Um, we don't worry about Bicycles as much. It is a bit of an issue if this gets banished off of the back of like Rise Heart or um, Shangri-La, uh, not Shangri-La effect, sorry, Mind Hacker's effect and everything else when it's banished from the top of the deck. But that is something you need to be wary of. Um, two works out nicely. You can pump it to three if you want to, but in this particular build, it's kind of done all right for me. I'm then playing the one gold, the one silver, and the one cerulean. Now, I know a lot of people will end up playing two cerulean or two silver and none of the gold, but the way I quite like it is between cerulean and silver, you can complete a full hand loop um, with triple tactics. Um, you can complete a full hand loop of five during your turn. Ultimately, even without that, you can still do a hand loop of uh, four with silver. Now, because Silver's Effect, it has to be two cards that your opponent puts back to their deck. If they only have one card in the hand, you can't Silver it. That's where Gold comes into play, because the idea is that you're going to give your opponent the Cerule, you would have looped them for four cards, so they've only got one card plus the Cerule to play with. They'll draw for turn, meaning they've got two cards plus the Cerule. As soon as they commit their first card, if it's a monster, that's when you'll have the ability, should they trigger an effect, to use the Greffa Fusion to discard the gold and get rid of those two cards, meaning that they only have one more card to play with and they'll still need to face down the rest of your board, which could be an Appalooza um, or anything else. Alternatively to that as well, not only by giving them Cerulean do you shut off the Cash Tira monsters, but you also shut off stuff like Evenies, Imperms during their turn, and Lightning Storm. So it's very, very painful giving your opponent a monster, and the fact that they've then got to try and play for it with two cards in the hand is absolutely insane, especially when one of them cards is going to get turned into I discard a card, or you as the Dark World player will discard a card, which ultimately leads you to gold or silver or anything else that you want to continue to do. So that's it for the Dark World Monsters, moving on to the dangers, now I know people want to play Lucian as well, um, completely viable option, it's entirely up to you on the way you try and build this, these are just structures to kind of give you an idea of what you can do. So for the dangers, I'm playing two Bigfoot, two Nessie, two Mothman, one Sukunoko, one Jackalope and one Thunderbird. Now again, dangers are entirely down to personal preference, um, if the luck is against you, you will hit a danger every single time, uh, unless of those one times when you actually want to hit a danger and then you won't, um, and then if luck is with you, these will all resolve and they'll give you additional monsters on the board, whether they be level 8s to help you extend your rank 8 plays, level 4s for your rank 4 plays, or just generally consistency cards of summoning itself, summoning one from the deck, um, or searching out another danger. Now the MVPs of this lineup is pretty much Thunderbird and uh, Bigfoot. Now I know a lot of you will be like, whoa, why are you main decking Thunderbird? Well the reason I'm main decking Thunderbird is I'm also main decking Book of Eclipse and that gives you a better out with Thunderbird because Thunderbird deals with set cards whereas Bigfoot deals with face up cards. It's also where activating trading, which I also play in the deck, can help you deal with back row, can also help you deal with front row and floodgates. One thing to um, remember under dangers is 
Dangers can still be activated even if you are under something like a Gozen or a Rivalry or anything like that because the outcome is not guaranteed. You are not guaranteed to summon it, which is why it's really important. So for example, let's say you're facing down a Vanities Fiend. Um, you can reveal, keep revealing dangers until you ideally hit a Bigfoot and then that Bigfoot can pop that Vanities Fiend and you're able to continue. Obviously the downside is because you're not summoning them, you will burn through resource very, very quickly. Another thing that needs to be said about the dangers is that they don't need to go to the graveyard to get their discard effects, they just need to be discarded. Now the difference between um, a dark world being discarded and a danger being discarded is a danger will trigger if it's just discarded in general, whereas a dark world needs to be discarded via card effect. So if these are centers cost, they will trigger. If these are centers cost, they will not trigger. And that's why when you activate trading, you get a pop and a draw off the back of Bigfoot, or you can get a back row pop or a set pop off of the back of Thunderbird, which is why it's also quite good in the cash Tira matchup, because if everyone is trying to play around the Nibiru, um, then they'll leave their board with just a Rise Heart, and that's when you can go, okay, cool, trade in, send Bigfoot, pop the Rise Heart, you don't need to worry about Banish anymore, and you don't need to worry about your cards being banished. Um, that's where it gets really important, is because by doing so, you then have the ability to kind of deal with everything else. Now, um, just so that everyone is clear as well, just where it says the danger, um, if this card is discarded, that's all it is. That's the clause to trigger all of the dangers. So that it doesn't it doesn't say if this card is discarded to the graveyard, which of course these do, um, whereas everything else just needs to be discarded, which is why they're quite important to be playing. The honorary danger that we are playing is the one Zephyrus the Elite, because you get this to the graveyard, you're able to then loop back a danger. Um, you can loop back some of your other cards as well, should you want to. You're gonna be looping cards back to your hand through the natural plays of Grefar, Rainbow, and everything else. Um, but I still really like Zephyrus, it just sucks when you're trying to get it discarded, and it just won't be discarded, it just stays stuck to your hand. Uh, another card that I like to play in the deck is Fairy Tale Luna. As you see, the deck doesn't actually have a designated normal summon. All of the cards you play can be um, discarded as discard fodder and then trigger additional effects. You don't actually need to normal summon them. Whereas by normal summoning something like Fairy Tale Luna, not only does it get to trigger to search out another copy of itself, so you've got a follow up for the next turn or you're replacing the advantage that you had in your hand, but it has a very neat quick effect to target a face up monster your opponent controls and then your opponent can send one card with that monster's name from their deck or extra deck to the graveyard to negate the effect. Now, if they can't send that monster to the graveyard, they cannot negate the effect. So that's why it's really good against Rise Heart, where you normal summon Luna, effective Luna to search out another copy of itself, effective Luna to target the Rise Heart and itself, return this back to the hand, return the Rise Heart back to the hand, and you've got rid of that annoying Banish Floodgate. On top of that, it's also an out to Shangri-La, and where the additional spice comes is it's also a way to loop your own kaijus back to your hand so that you can do it again. Now you can do it with Lava Golem if you want to, but obviously as you can see, Lava Golem and Fairy Tail Luna will clash, whereas with a kaiju it doesn't. The only downside of a kaiju is it will only deal with one monster rather than two, so if they put two Omni Negates on the board, you will need to bait one of them out. And that's where Luna comes into play, because just normal summoning Luna and then threatening to search out another copy of itself is going to gain you that resource if your opponent lets that happen. And then you've got the ability of the quick effect Luna to bounce. Another thing with Luna is if it does not get negated but stays on the field, you still have that quick effect interruption during your opponent's next turn as well. Fairytale Luna can also bounce the Cerulee back to your hand, and that's how you can loop the Cerulee without even needing to go to your extra deck. But we do play a card called a Cashier Magician in our extra deck in order to do that as well. The last monster card that I do play is Astral Karibo, and the reason I play the Astral Karibo is it's just a very nice extender that helps get you into your rank fours and can also help get you specifically into your um, Hope Harbinger. Now keep in mind, Astral Karibo reads as follows as you reveal a number XYZ from the extra deck, and here's a preview of the numbers that we play. Um, special on this card and it becomes the same level as the rank, so it can be a level four or a level eight. You are locked into number XYZs while it is on the field. So straight away you're gonna turn it into a Hope Harbinger or a Baguska or a Daguerreus, and that lock is unlocked for you. One additional route that Astral Creo can really help with is it can get you into Dragula Bond and then Numeron Dragon, which is a nice route and a push to an OTK. But the idea is it's going to be there as a way of playing under Shifter. You can get into a Baguska nice and easily and control the board state. It can also go into the Geras where you'll get the ability to draw through cards. And it can also be one of them late game kind of extenders that you summon it down and then overlay into a Hope Harbinger, which um, as a lot of people forget, this can negate a spell card, but it can also help you redirect attacks to itself. If your opponent is trying to kill one of your lower attack monsters, it can be very, very nice redirection that will cause your opponent a lot of issues. Um, and that's why I quite like um, the Astral Karibos, it's just a free extender. 
Now you can play other cards as well. Um, you can play stuff like the Zalamander. You can play stuff like Beige. But the reason I went with Astral Kribo is it can be a 4 or an 8 depending on what I want it for. Uh, so that's it for the monsters. Moving on to the spells. We are on a 42 card deck because you kind of really need to be playing triple tactics talents. Now the reason this is so important is because when you give your opponent a Ceruli, Ceruli triggers as if your opponent has activated it, meaning that straight away you can control how you can make triple tactics live. If you do have Frost, you can put Frost in here as well, uh, but ideally just getting to a triple tactics is just as powerful. Now the reason that is so good is because you can look at your opponent's hand with triple tactics, put back a card that will either cause you issues or help your opponent break a board, and then if you bounce the Cerulee back to your hand and hand loop them again, they have no cards in their hand bar the one card that they draw for turn, and considering that one card they draw for turn usually is going to get met with the Greffer Dragon and it's going to get turned into I discard a card, um, that pretty much means nothing and it ultimately leads you to a guaranteed game. We then play two Gates of the Dark World. Now I know quite a few players do play three of this to go with your free Genta, but the way I see it is I don't actually want to see this card in my hand. I want to see Genta first. I want to use Genta's effect to search it, draw a card, and then bounce that Genta back to the hand to use it again. Genta can only be special summoned as a hard once per turn, but it can be discarded as many times as you have Gates left in your deck to then be able to reactivate them. The benefit of the first gate is that you banish the Genta from the graveyard, meaning you get it back to the board as a free play. But then the second gate, you're actually going to burn a bit of resource because that one thing that you do banish is not going to come back to the board or give you any form of ex additional extension. And that's where also Astral Karibo comes in quite nicely as it is a fiend that can be utilized off the back of this. And that's where Lava Golem would give you a little bit of an edge because it is also a fiend as well. We are playing two trade in because not only can trade in put um, Greffa and Rainbow to the graveyard, it won't trigger their effects because it does discard as cost, but it does give you a way of discarding and manually triggering the um, Bigfoot and of course Thunderbird as well as drawing two cards as well. So it's one of them ones that you kind of control everything you need and it gives you draw capabilities. You could go for something like Allure of Darkness, but you actually have a lot of targets in the deck for this. So you've got three Rainbow, plus three of your Kaiju, so that's six in total, plus the two Greffers is eight, and then you add the additional three targets of Bigfoot and Thunderbird to the list, giving you eight, uh, 11 targets for your trade in play. The last two of that I play in the deck is two Book of Eclipse. So as you can already see, with the dangers, you've got a couple of Ghost Second cards and Triple Tactics. But then being able to add a Book of Eclipse to this, not only can it be a defensive card for going first, because the majority of your end board will be uh, Link Monsters plus um, a Fusion Monster, nine times out of 10. And then the best thing about the Fusion Monster is if this gets negated, um, you do get that very cool ability to actually have the quick effect of your accession, which you're gonna loop around in order to create a second one. So meaning that even if they Book of Eclipse it and you go, yeah, that's fine, I'll let that go through. Um, you then have the ability of activating a session to then go again anyway. And the last card is the Dark World Archives. I think a lot of people cut this, but I quite like this ability that as long as I've got a Dark World on the board, I have the ability to, again, myself control a Dark World discard and give me the capabilities of drawing. Now the Dark World Archives is draw and discard as effect. So you do need to be able to get a card to your hand in order to legally activate it. Now the reason this works out so nicely is if you actually discard the rainbow off the back of this, you can go chain it one archives and chain it two rainbow. Rainbow can search you out a silver for example, and then you can resolve the archives by discarding that silver and drawing two new cards. I believe you still need to have a dark world in the hand because you still need to be able to um, activate this and resolve it on activation. Um, but it's still just a nice way that you, rather than discarding the card you have in your hand, you can discard the card you search off of the rainbow, which is really, really cool. Not to mention if you search and then discard the Greffer off the back of this, you will get a nice pop because again, like I said, it discards as effect, not as cost, which is why it's actually a really cool card for the deck. Uh, moving on to the extra deck, pretty staple on this one is two Greffer Dragons. Um, this card's absolutely nuts and it's what makes the deck as good as it is. So keeping in mind with the Greffer Dragon, it will turn the first normal spell or normal trap your opponent activates into I or you as the Dark World player discards a card. It will not do it to a quick effect, so it can be negated and popped by some of the runic cards but um, and even the field spell because that will go through unopposed. Uh, it's still incredibly powerful because it gets to switch that effect and you're going to usually be backing up with something like an Appalooza that deals with monster effects as well. Uh, moving on to the XYZs, I've pretty much already shown you these. You've got the Daguerres because it lets you draw and then discard as part of effect. So that will help you trigger your Dark Worlds. Baguska, just for those kind of really control-esque games. Now, obviously, it's going to be less so against trap cards because they'll be able to bounce this and get rid of it as and when they see fit. Um, but definitely in like a Cash Tira matchup, this can really slow it down for you. 
Uh, the one Hope Harbinger, again, it's just a very nice defensive card that deals with the first spell card your opponent can activate or any spell card of your choosing. Then we still got the Coach King Giant Trainer. This is just a really good card for going first because not only can you hand loop your opponent, but you can already, already put them at a massive disadvantage by burning them for up to 2,400 life points and drawing free cards. Now, yes, it does suck if this gets impermed, but it needs to get impermed in order to do that. And by the time you end up committing to a Giant Trainer, you've probably already done quite a lot and you're just doing it as extra extension. You can't conduct the battle phase to turn you activate this effect. So keep that in mind. If they're playing this and they go second, for example, and they make a giant trainer to draw more cards and try and burn through cards or anything like that, they can't conduct their battle phase. So it will be a very massive misplay if they if they do that. Um, so make sure you catch it. Then for the Link Monsters, we've got Cross Sheep, because Cross Sheep, not only will it get the Fusion ability to bring back a level 4 or lower, but it can also get the XYZ ability, which reduces all your opponent's monsters attack by 700. We've then got the Akashic Magician. Now this is the extra deck version of Fairy Tail Luna. Um, it does mean that you need to be very careful with your placements of your Kaiju and your Cerulee because you want to make sure that they go in front of the extra monster zones. Uh, Akashic Magician has the ability um, that it requires two monsters with the same type except tokens, which is very easy to do because a lot of your um, Dark Worlds are of course themes. You just can't use a Danger and a Dark World. Keep that in mind unless you have a very specific Dark World. Uh, sorry, da um, Danger and the Danger is Chupacabra, which we don't play. If it is Link Summoned, you return all monsters this card points to to the hand. So it's very nice to loop back a danger as well, should you want to use that again. Uh, and you also get the ability to declare one card name. You excavate the top card of your deck equal to the total link range of link monsters co-linked to this card. And then if you excavate any copies of the declared card, you add it to the hand. So that card's less effective, but it will put a card in the graveyard for you. I still like the Mutt Rocker play um, because the Mutt Rocker play, for those of you that are new to this channel and haven't seen this before, uh, it comes off very nicely with the World Sea Dragon Zelantis. And the way that this works is you make World Sea Dragon Zelantis, then you make the Mutt Rocker, use Mutt Rocker's effect to, um, uh, Rocker, sorry, to discard a card and bring back a fiend monster, locking you into fiends. Zelantis' effect, when it banishes the board, makes you bring back the monsters, not your opponent, you. So if you activate Zelantis' effect, you'll banish the entire board, and then because you're Fiend Lock, you can only bring back Fiends, meaning that you don't bring back or you can't bring back any of your opponent's monsters unless they are Fiends, but you bring back all of your monsters that are Fiends. At that point as well, you'll still have the capabilities to extend that little bit further with additional Fiend plays and everything else that you need to do. Uh, now keep in mind as well that it does lock you from Fiends... Um, for the rest of this turn. So you get to do everything else that you need to uh, and then continue to make your plays with stuff like your Greffa um, and because the idea is that the card you discard for this is going to be a Dark World card and that will trigger its effect to summon itself back plus you'll get the ability to revive a Dark World. So you're going to end up with two Dark Worlds that both can be bounced back to the hand to go for a Rainbow and a Greffa which straight away are going to be 3,000 and 2,800 and then you've got the Mutt Rocker on its board um, which is going to be a 1,000. So that is what, Sir 5878. And then if you've got the field spell in play, that is OTK game straight there for you. For the other link too, we've got IP Mascarina going into Nightmare Unicorn, obviously to kind of coincide with IP, but also with the Fiend Lock as well. Skulldreg, Skulldreg is actually really cool in this deck because you get the ability to dig through your deck, get the card you want, and then you can extend that little bit further by special summoning a monster to a zone it points to. The benefit of that as well is if you go in first and you draw a kaiju, because a lot of people are playing kaijus and main decking them, you can even use Skulldreg's effect to special summon that kaiju down, and then straight away your opponent cannot kaiju you because you can only control one kaiju, which is really nice. Uh, Appalooza, and then the last card that kind of took the spot of Zeus is the Underworld Goddess, and the reason I put this in here is again if you're in Fiend Lock, you can go into this, and this is a really good card to uh, grind down the uh, Kashtira play. If they've only got the Kashtira Birth, you can constantly keep using Underworld Goddess to stop them reviving um, from the Banished Zone or Grave, which is really, really important, and it can also help you um, really slow the game down and control it. So that's it for the extra deck, that's it for the whole entire deck. I hope this has given you a couple of ideas of your own build. This is an update that I've done from a while ago. Um, it's definitely got a little bit more heat, which is really nice to kind of see because I, you know, the second that this deck dropped, I knew that it was going to have capabilities and it's been able to play through the tier format and in a format where I felt it would struggle, um, it's actually started to do very, very well, which is quite nice because it's nice to see that this doesn't just auto lose to cash tiers. They do have ways to play around it. And I have kind of personally played around with different variants, which is why you see the Astral 
Central Karibo. It's why you see the Fairy Tale Luna. It's all different cards that I wanted to add to the deck that gave you the ability to kind of deal with that and uh, play through the the like 20 board uh, 20 zone lock and everything else that the cash tiers can produce. Anyway, uh, if you do have any questions at all, please put them in the comments down below. I will be more than happy to answer them. However, for now, as absolutely always, guys, smash that like button, hit that notification bell, subscribe, and as always, stay safe, and of course, happy dueling.